Roots, Roots Binale Jogja 16 Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ais Purwaji. I am a, a co-curator for uh, Biennale Jogja 2021. Hello everyone. Uh, and uh, today we have uh, uh, three uh, artists here with us. Uh, uh, here is uh, Edith Amitwanai uh, and Maria Madeira and Sipan Janilal. Uh, they are they are uh, they are. Uh, very wonderful artists and uh, come from a, a very diverse background. Uh, and today I want to talk with uh, them about the, their works and their practices and also uh, the notion of a diaspora uh, that uh, also one of uh, the, the was like a main thing that uh, we are discussed in this Biennale. Uh, this discussion will be uh, conducted in English. Uh, so uh, uh, you guys uh, can uh, was like uh, uh, was like follow us uh, on the English uh, language. Uh, yeah. Selamat siang, teman-teman. Uh, terima kasih sudah bergabung dalam diskusi atau artist talk pada siang hari ini. Nama saya Astro Aji dan saya adalah salah satu dari kurator Bienal Jogja 2021. Uh, bersama kita pada siang hari ini ada. Edith Amitwanai, Maria Madeira, dan Sipan Janilal. Mereka adalah seniman-seniman uh, yang uh, turut memamerkan karya dan berpartisipasi di Bienal Jogja pada uh, siang hari ini. Uh, kami akan banyak berdiskusi tentang praktek mereka, karya-karya mereka, uh, dengan uh, apa namanya cerita-cerita di baliknya. Lalu kami juga akan banyak berdiskusi tentang gagasan-gagasan uh, mengenai uh, diaspora. Dan uh, diskusi ini akan uh, diselenggarakan dalam bahasa Inggris. Jadi teman-teman uh, bisa mengikutinya dalam dalam bahasa Inggris dan bisa bertanya uh, melalui uh, apa kolom komentar di face di YouTube. Uh, nanti akan kami sampaikan juga kepada para pembicaranya. Uh, ya, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Edith, Sipanjani, and Maria Madeira uh, for coming this afternoon and uh, talk with us. Uh, first, I want to uh, uh, read uh, your uh, short background, so uh, the audience can uh, can know about uh, your your uh, practice. So, uh, Edith Amitwanai, born in 1981 in New Zealand, is a Samoan photographer working in Tamaki Maukarau, uh, Auckland, from interiors to driveways to communities. Amitwana's practice is concerned with the environment that shaped who we are. During uh, 2000, 2008 and 2019, Edith worked on interior series of Samoan transnational community and has taken her to Samoa, New Zealand, France, Canada, and the United States. Its location and subsequent generation revealing new 
and dynamic ways that culture does and does not travel with people as they move around the globe. In 2008, she was nominated for the Walter Prize for her series, The Junior, that examined a new Pacific diaspora, expatriate New Zealand Samoan rugby players living and working in Montpellier, France, and Parma, Northern Italy. She has exhibited extensively in galleries and museums across Aotearoa and internationally in Australia, Austria, Taiwan, Germany, and France. In 2019, her works was included in the Transits and Returns exhibition at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Her artwork is held in national collection, including Auckland Art Gallery, Toy O Tamaki, Museum in, of New Zealand Te Papa Tong Tongarewa, Christchurch Art Gallery, and Goffet Drexler Art Gallery. So, uh, hello, Edith. Uh, how are you? Hello, how how hello how are you yeah yeah uh oh it's it's a wonderful and uh we are uh, very grateful to have uh, your uh photograph series uh to show in this biennale so maybe uh i want to talk to you first uh yes. maybe you can tell uh the story behind uh, your uh series your your photograph um Many of the photographs that are in the exhibition are taken from sitting rooms or living rooms, yeah. mostly uh, living rooms from New Zealand and or Samoa or America. And I started to notice many years ago a kind of migrant aesthetic um, that seemed to be prevalent in the homes that I knew uh, versus the Kiwi kids or the New Zealand kids whose homes um, didn't look much like mine. And I realized that there was a kind of pattern and a kind, uh, and this pattern was uh, consistent across uh, oceans and across borders that uh, there were the same kinds of things inside the homes, even though they were in different countries. And uh, I was fascinated by this idea of, uh, displaying a kind of cultural pattern, whether it was inherent or if it was taught. But also I was really aware that because I was born in New Zealand, my home would look very different to this kind of aesthetic that I had grown up with. And uh, my parents, while well, my mom and dad were born in Samoa and then moved to New Zealand, I knew that the sitting room that I would make or the living room that I would make would be very different to the kind of aesthetic that I was starting to recognize amongst my parents generation as a migrant yeah, aesthetic and then I found that it was quite common uh, in other cultures when I saw like West Indian front rooms in London like Caribbean households in London had a similar aesthetic which I could um uh, I guess could have pinpoint to having the same similarities of Christianity, but maybe it was an Anglo-Saxon uh, sort of colonial um, England as the motherland, uh, having the same sort of overtones of aesthetic. So, um, yeah, I think that they may seem very ordinary as as in interiors, but they they're incredibly fascinating to me, particularly because I knew. Um, my generation, having grown up in a Western way, wouldn't make um, an interior like that. Yeah, I guess that's a fast track to the work that uh, is on show. Yeah, uh, thank you, Edith. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that's uh, very interesting when you're uh, talking about the, uh, the migrant aesthetic, because... Yeah. In, in some ways, it's uh, quite a different between uh, the, the, the migrant, uh, the interior of the migrant houses with the, with the locals, with the, with the people who uh, resides in the New Zealand. Do you think about it? I think um, Christianity is particularly prevalent and has um, 
such an influence on these houses. So yeah. uh, I recent um, about ten years ago, I I worked with a refugee family from Myanmar, and they were Chin refugees who had come to West Auckland uh, from the Chin area, but they were Christian, and uh, even their households had similar attributes to the kind of house that I was in uh, that I was familiar with. And I did think that there was um, perhaps a, the influence of religion or maybe the value of religion featured in the house. So well, perhaps what I learned is um, the house is a representation of what you value. Yeah. Mm, so, I, you know, if you value certain religion, it's often um, placed in a place of prominence for, for, for everyone to see. And then um, child... Um, accomplishments or your accomplishments as a family are often uh, displayed on the wall and a couch uh, and sometimes the couch is framed with photos of uh, the family or flanked by pictures of the last supper so um, yeah it became kind of a pattern I started to notice in certain households yes right uh, thank you uh, for the short uh, was like um, introduction to your works. It's wonderful, and uh, maybe uh, later we can talk more on the on on your works. Uh, and uh, now I want to jump uh, to other artists here. Uh, Sifanja Nilal. Uh, I will. I would love to uh, read uh, her short bio. Uh, Sifanja Nilal was born uh, in 1982 in New South Wales, is a uh, PG Indian Australia design artist and curator based in Australia and UK. Uh, she finished her bachelor studies from the University of Wollongong in 2005, master studies on art management from University of Melbourne uh, in 2008, uh, bachelor of photography and visual art from Australian Academy of Design, Melbourne uh, in 2020, uh, Master of Arts and Community from PCN MCM Melbourne 2014 and at the moment she is on the, her final year of Master Studies of on Moving Image in Goldsmith University London since 2020. Long history of family movement, her works use personal grief to account for ancestral loss and healing. She is a member of the identical Sourced from uh, photo albums, along with the video and images from contemporary travels to the Asia Pacific to reconstruct temporary landscapes. Sipanjani has had several ex solo exhibitions since 2018, uh, 2011 in Australia, New Zealand, and India. She also exhibited in several group shows and was involved in inter international residences. Hello, Sipanjani. Hi. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. First we met. Uh, you are still in London, but uh, now you are yeah. uh, coming back to Australia, right? Yeah. So I'm back in Australia. I've been back home for the last four weeks now. Um, yeah, it's yeah. a curious thing to be able to travel in this very strange time. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah. Okay. We are very honored to uh, always like uh, show your works, and uh, it's been a very interesting process because uh, you know uh, to get the can uh, what's like the the can uh, yeah. is uh, not uh, so easy today because <laughs> so so yeah. our staff is has to be uh, travel to other areas to find the uh, can. <laughs> but yeah, but it's, a, it's a very very interesting works. Uh, lots yeah. of people uh, talking uh, and asking uh, to me about uh, your background uh, about your works and uh, yeah. show people them. Yeah. Um. So, I guess this this work is like in line, like is 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 a new direction. So it's really. Um, uh, so it was really exciting that the Biennale was interested in the work um, because firstly it begins with a story um, and it's sort of like is about trying to 
prototype a type of mythology around what it means to be diasporic. Um, but it also is trying to look for or trying to build monuments for histories that are not accounted for, but really maybe thinking about monuments as temporary or temporal things that only exist for a short time. Uh, and uh, it sort of began, the research for this project began with the idea or stemming from this point of departure, which is, is that 2020 was the centenary of the end or the abolition of indentured labour. So the dates are a bit tricky or iffy um, in the sense that there was one date and then anybody who came after that date, which is about 2015, between 2015, 1915 to 1917, but anybody who came between that period that had signed a contract um, still had to see out their contracts and all of those contracts expired in 1920 and uh, post-slavery movement of, of bodies um, and these bodies feel to me unaccounted and it's a, it's a history that's not really been spoken of and there is deep connections with Australia as well as um, the UK in relationship to these things. And so in many ways, this, um, this work is an attempt to create a monument for a community that was never allowed to be acknowledged. And a lot of the work stems from these walks that I would do last year um, when I moved to London. And I was thinking a lot about my dad and about how as a child, he walked barefoot to get an education and about the distances that enabled us, like, the, the dis that that I was also doing this I was walking to get an education and um and this idea of a better life and about this colonial um validation of the movement of bodies was to kind of generate this idea of a better life and uh and but also setting up the the infrastructure that would mean that it would be almost impossible to get that better life uh, because really they're setting up structures of poverty. <laughs> um, and, and so um, I collect a lot of things and because the world kind of meant when I was in the UK, I, I had to kind of bring these things that I brought, uh, like had found. And one of the things that I found um, were the sugar sacks and the sugar sacks. This isn't the sugar sack that I that um, I found, but it's kind of using this as a basis to kind of speak to this history. And um, what is really interesting is that um, before the pandemic hit last year, I asked my gaki, my auntie, uh, from who was coming to visit us in Australia, to, to bring me a whole bunch of sugar sacks. And she said to me she couldn't find any in the market because we get our sugar from India. And I just thought that this is really um, a full circle moment of, like, the cane industry is dying in Fiji and... In this, in this loss, there is a whole history that passes or disappears and who is responsible for um, having that conversation be present and how do we um, ensure that, like, and also because, like, I'm a diaspora kid. Like, I, I was born in Fiji, but I grew up in Australia. So there is this sort of, oh, that, that history didn't happen to me, but I then go to my grandmother's house and there's this weird schism where it used to be a sugarcane farm, but now it is not. And so, but actually that farm was a plantation. And so then these things get convoluted, but also need to be reimagined or re like, like the language needs to change. And I'm not like, I feel like I'm still trying to figure out those things, but I also think that these are complex histories and it's a real privilege to be able to be even be able to share it like in this kind of way and also like I think it's like for me like the other counterpart to this there is this visual where people can walk into the space and kind of see these sculptural elements but there is also this other element which is the story that I tell 
um, which is, well, the work is called Five Prayers for Five Generations, and it, it's this five-part story where it's really a love letter to my parents and to my grandmothers, you know, and about the history that is held in our bodies. And also, you know, like I think one of the things that I keep thinking about is, is that I don't want to talk about trauma. I want to talk about the hope that also exists in our bodies and the potential we all have. Um, but I also think that is actually multiple people's responsibility. So it's like, I'm going to share this story with you, but you have to hold it with me, you know, like how do we make, how do we allow those accountabilities to happen? Like, and that, like that, I don't know, like that I'm still like working on, but, um, you know, like I think it's really, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't, yeah, like it, it, like that's, that, that's, that's the hope that I think is like in my brain, but I don't like, yeah. It's great. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, you know, uh, lots of people in uh, the audience of uh, Jogja Biennale can easily relate to your words because uh, we share a similar uh, history because lots of uh, people, uh, Japanese people, uh, has uh, transported to, to Suriname or to uh, New Caledonia as a worker uh, for the sugar industry too. So uh, actually we have a, like a similar similar. Uh, what like a history, like a colonial history, yeah. uh, that uh, was like a, uh, was like mobilized uh, our ancestors to other parts of the world. That yeah, uh, yeah. so they they was like uh, uh, they cannot uh, really uh, was like uh, uh, intact with their uh, roots of culture again. So. Yeah. And I think also these, um, our roots get, um, uh, like, for me, I feel like I am a Pacific person with South Asian heritage and, uh, and I am, and I'm grateful for that because, you know, that, 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 that complexity is part of who I am. Um, and it's also an acknowledgement of the movement of bodies that have enabled me to come to this place as well. Um, but also like um, how, like, you know, like I, I'm in this privileged position to be able to speak of it through my work. And I think it kind of hopefully kind of, hopefully does this thing where it kind of puts a, like a lens on it that kind of allows other people's to think about it empathetically you know because these movements of bodies still happen you know there's still like a pacific labor law uh both in australia and new zealand that move pacific bodies into these spaces because of a lack of labor um and the legacy of that is indenture <laughs> you know um and and like we're supposed to be like oh this is a great opportunity for uh, Pacific bodies, but actually they're not, you know, they, they, they're, they're, those, those visas silo communities, they don't enable them to kind of actually live full and complete lives. And, and, and so then you're living these half lives and, and that's like, that's incredibly unfair. You know, we're not, um, expats were migrants and we're not even migrants we're workers um, yeah yeah thank you and uh, now I will move uh, to uh, the last uh, artist here <laughs> uh, uh, Maria Madeira uh, was born in Vieno Timor Leste evacuated from uh, Timor by the Portuguese in 1976 uh, during the Indonesian invasion, she spent most of the following. Uh, she spent most of the following eight years in a refugee camp run by the Red Cross on the 
outskirts of Lisbon in Portugal. She migrated with her family to Australia in 1983. Over the years, she obtained several academic qualifications. She graduated, she graduated with a BA Fine Arts a degree from a Cartin University in 1991. Two years later, she received a graduate diploma on, of education from the same university. In 1998, uh, 1996, Uh, she obtained her second degree, a BA in political science from Murdoch University. In 2019, she finally obtained a postgraduate uh, doctor of philosophy art uh, from Curtin University in Australia. Between 1998, uh, 1996 and uh, 2000, she worked in Western Australia as a high school art teacher, visual artist and cultural advisor for several arts and cultural organizations. Between the 2000 and 2000, 2004, uh, she returned to the Timor-Leste to live and play her part in the recovery, rebuilding, and development of her beloved country and the newest nation in Asia. She mm -hmm. currently lives in Perth with her partner and son. Maria works with uh, various mediums from painting, sculpture, drawing, mixed media collage, and installation. Her works have been exhibited internationally in 30 countries, including Australia, Portugal, Brazil, Macau, Indonesia, Timor Leste, and so on. So, uh, Maria, <laughs> we, yes, we meet turn. again. <laughs> your turn. Yes. It's uh, wonderful to see uh, your works. And uh, actually, uh, uh, there is some of the artists uh, we are invited from uh, from uh, Timor Island, uh, Indonesian part, that uh, also uh, exhibiting uh, her uh, his uh, was like. Uh, traditional clothes or ties mm -hmm. so it resembles to your works actually uh, 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 like uh, your works and uh, he, he, his works is uh, was like a dialogue having a dialogue between right so right. that's a very wonderful to see uh, so yeah can you uh, tell uh, the story be, uh, behind no, I'm, work? I'm really happy to see that the work does speak and it creates a dialogue because I perceive myself sometimes to be a bridge yeah. between East Timor and the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And I believe that with what happened to East Timor yeah. and the history that we've gone through, uh, a lot of Timorese felt this sense that we might lose our culture. And it's sad to say that in East Timor, we don't really have this notion of an art school or we don't even, we don't, you know, a gallery didn't exist in, in East Timor until maybe five years ago. And if uh, the East Timorese uh, emerging artists want to produce work, they actually have to go overseas to buy art materials because we don't even have an art shop. So in the history of East Timor, the notion of art, especially contemporary art is very new. And I feel, I feel very, very lonely in this journey because um, this in the country, if it's not traditional, it's not art. So if you ask an East Timorese, how come there's never been an art school? And they say, well, why? Why do we have an art school if we leave it? It's a living culture. And the Taj, the traditional East Timorese cloth that you see, is very much a prominent feature of our culture. If a foreigner comes into the country, the first thing they see, they see is the Taj because you offer the Taj as salendum to say, welcome to our nation, our motherland. And although I love sculpture, I'm more into sculptural work. So Shivan Javi, I love your work. <laughs> and, but I believe that I have to speak to the younger generation of East Timor, as well as provide a voice for the older generation of East Timor. Um, so I use the Taj a lot, but also with the notion that, that with textiles is the way that the Portuguese also managed to introduce a lot of the Portuguese culture into East Timor. And um, that's why I've got, I've got some work there that talks about Portuguese Timor, where I use sort of the image of the crochet because when the Portuguese arrived in Timor and they wanted to introduce Catholicism to the East Timorese, they, they didn't try to stop the tradition of the East Timorese, the, the, the primordial um, language of the East Timorese. They thought, hmm, maybe we will look at their textiles 
and trying to reintroduce the imagery of, of a lot of uh, Catholic iconic image to the Taj. And, um, and that's how the women started to use the, the, a lot of the crochet sort of cross point image in the Taj. And then it was through that that they started to show culture to, to the rest of the locals and the East Timorese. And um, I think also that, that East Timorese culture is very feminine. So I'm, I'm, I'm often perceived as a feminist, <laughs> but I honestly at home, I'm not. <laughs> but I am a feminist in terms of providing a voice for the minority groups. And uh, obviously I speak from a female point of view because I think that the, the culture of East Timor is very feminine and it's held by the women only. The men are the voice, uh, they, they introduce, they speak in public about the culture, but the production of it is all female. Basketry, textiles, um, basketry textiles, and a lot of the dancing, a lot of the performance art is, is taught by the, the women. And since the team is team independence, I think that that notion of women being very outspoken or being very strong in the fabric of our society is it's sort of being pushed down because um, it, we can't be seen in public. We do things, but we don't speak it. So, okay, the women you cook and, the, and everybody comes in here and says, oh, it's such wonderful food. But the women are not there to say, oh yeah, yeah, I cooked. How about my food? You know, and then they show the beautiful Taj, they introduce it to the tourists and to the dignitaries. But it's all about showing, but not speaking about it. So I thought, let's speak about it. So my work is very much about the women of Timor. And that's why you've got like the, the work that you see there where uh, the Taj, I introduced it with the, the um, crochet to show the merger between the East Timorese and, and the foreign, in the diaspora. And then I also use a lot of um, traditional uh, things that we find in nature, like rocks, uh, the betel nut, we, we use a lot of betel nut to have a connection with the ancestry. So I use a lot of betel nut in my painting because I, all, well, now we've got a, the last two years, maybe we've got a few young, female artists coming through in East Timor. But the women who are very, very strong with the arts are actually in the diaspora because we are allowed to. If I was in Timor, I wouldn't be able to, you know, 20 years ago, I wouldn't be able to do this because there's no way, no facilities for me to learn. But because I'm in Portugal, I'm in Australia, the lucky country, I'm allowed to speak out, I'm allowed to flourish as an artist. And, and the, the, the notion of the flower is because the East Timorese women are seen as flowers. So let's say if there is an engagement and the husband's family comes to talk to my family, they don't say, oh, my son really likes Maria. They say, well, my son went pa came past here and saw a beautiful garden, there was a beautiful flower and he wants to pick it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not even an entity as such, I'm a flower. But if, the, if my father doesn't want it, he says, well, yeah, I've got a beautiful flower, but you cows came here and destroyed it. Meaning you can't have my daughter for marriage. So I use the flower. And, and I think a flower should be nourished, should, should be loved, should be tendered and, and to allow it to flourish. But as an Eastern Miss woman, <laughs> you know, if I talk like this in Timor, a lot of people will say, oh my gosh, where is she coming from? <laughs> So that's why I've got there, where's my independence? I've got the flower, you know, stuck in the middle of the, the, the grades, like I'm in prison, I'm not allowed to flourish. And a lot of the natural materials is to say to, to these Timorese, while we're waiting for, for an art shop, let's use the rock, let's use the betel nut, let's use the red earth, that, you know, when it rains, the red earth is very prominent. And, um, you know, I just, um, I'm trying to show the, the, a lot of the younger people that yes, we are women. Yes, we can talk and we can create. And while we're waiting for an art school, a proper official art school and an art shop and a proper gallery, let's use what we've got. And I think that's what I learned from the diaspora to be strong 
and I'm trying to implement that into his team or and say we can be strong we can have a voice not just being visual being looking beautiful we can create so that's what I'm about and and, and this painting of the Thai share it's actually being in the sun for about three months I used the sun to paint it so it, it was very colorful so I covered up with a lot of materials and let the sun just uh, dry the rest and and make it whitish because we've got a new Timor Leste means sunrise. We've got new sunrise, new world, new independence. Let's create with the Mother Earth and what it can give us. So that's oh, what I'm about. Wonderful, wonderful, Maria. And uh, you know, uh, actually, uh, there is uh, one uh, uh, another uh, Timor Leste artist uh, in this Biennale. Uh, uh, he, yes. His name is. Uh, Mong uh, or Simao Cardoso. Yes, yes. And and also his uh, video works is uh, talking about the betel nut, the the tradition to show a uh, betel yes, nut. Yes, yes. And uh, the in uh, what like in the related in relation with the uh, with the local uh, local spirituality. I think. Yes. So yeah, it's wonderful uh, that uh, it's connected to your works also. Yes, uh, the yes. Betel nut, yeah. Yeah, they, because when I first arrived in Timor, I had to go back to my birthplace and they used the betel nut so that my, my ancestry could recognize me. So yeah. we, we chew betel nut. And then because we believe it's, it's also the, 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 the food that they eat. Mm. And everyone in Timor is trying to paint, you know, people chewing betel nut, people chewing betel nut. And I thought, why yeah. don't you paint with betel nut? Don't paint someone trying to chew and paint and <laughs> the betel nut. We just... You know, let's have the battle now and then just spit on the canvas, and that's what I did. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. Just, just growing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's 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 uh, interesting for me uh, in in your short video was uh, uh, you are displaced uh, from your home country in the seventy uh, six, uh, and then uh, in two thousand you are coming back to your uh, uh, in your motherland. Yes. Uh, to and and uh, how uh, the the process to recollecting uh, your your tradition like a big, because you are displaced from your motherland for so long, so how, how uh, the the process to recollecting the the um, I, yeah. I found it was very difficult because I I noticed that when we were in the refugee camp every Timorese was trying to keep on to the culture, so everything was so traditional. We try to keep it. Oh no! If we if, if we don't sing our songs, if we don't show our ties, we lose it. But when I went to East Timor, I found it was actually quite advanced from what we are trying to um, preserve. Because there was well, one thing was the language. You know, the tattoo was mixed with with Bahasa. Um, the you know, and then I went there with my tattoo with the Portuguese. So there was already. Um, a change of the development of language there. I mean, we're having a big, big problem now trying to figure out how to write in Tetum because I will speak Tetum with English and Portuguese mixed and the people who live there during the occupation will speak it with um, the, the Indonesian. You know, I was really like, you know, I say, oh, I, I, I'm really Sibuk. I'm Sibuk, like I'm really busy. You know, they go, how ha, Sibuk, how Sibuk, you know? And I'm thinking, what's that? And, and every time I spoke to them, they spoke in Indonesia in terms of, oh, this is Dopulusen. This is, you know, the cost of And I'm thinking, oh, what is Dopulusen? You know, and then I had to learn to communicate with them. And then they had to learn to communicate with me, although we had a common language. And, um, but I, I think that the notion of trying to preserve the culture as a refugee, we yeah, actually get me behind a little bit because they're progressing in my country. You know, and now I'm trying to be the bridge where, okay, we're progressive, you're progressive. How about we have a meeting in the middle, <laughs> a meeting point? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. you, you know, because uh, uh, we, we choose uh, this Biennale with the title of uh, Roots and Route because uh, here we are interesting to, to the, the reality of the, the, the diaspora because uh, our reality is, is, the, is a change after the, the European or the history of colonialism mm. and the discovery of cartography, the expansion of uh, transportation and the emergence of the internationalist ideas. Uh, so I think uh, the diaspora thing now is uh, taking the world uh, and shaping our realities 
Uh, yeah. But uh, that's that's uh, the, the same question is applied to the Sipanjani. Like, uh, mm. how uh, as a like a the, the diaspora yourself, uh, you define your roots. Uh, like a Maria, uh, how, how you define uh, your roots? I mean, I always think about the fact that I feel like I was twice removed. Um, like, firstly, in that, um, like, in that my great grandmother is like was a Girmitia, so she left South Asia, she left India, and she came on boats to Fiji. And then my family in 85 left Fiji to come to Australia. Um, and we came pre-coup, pre the first coup. And so um, I have these really distinct memories of like having my family come live with us. Like we lived in a very small house um, in Lidcombe in like Western Sydney. But I remember post coup, like there was probably a period between the late 80s, early 90s where like whole families lived in rooms in our house and and maybe that's like a slight exaggeration but it's like my dad was the eldest and so lots of people came through our house and uh and there was like and I was like a really shy kid and I remember there's this story that my sister tells and my sister's like 11 and 13 years older and I was I was two when I came to Australia so I don't have a lot of memories pre my life in Fiji I only have memories afterwards and she says this really sweet thing where she said, you know, she'd be really like she it would we'd be in one bed together, me, my younger brother and her. And she'd sleep on the edge because she didn't want us to fall off the bed. And I think that the, there's something about um, the the kind of sleeping on the edge feeling of being from diaspora. You're never quite comfortable in your bed um no matter how long you live in a space um and also I think um like I mean it less so now but there were definitely moments as a teenager growing up people would be like where are you from and that question is really frustrating because actually like it's like do you want the dissertation like what do you like or do you like or do you want like 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 or are you asking why you why you different like what like what is the purpose of that question like you know where are you from is really um it's like it's like I've lived in Australia for over 30 years like what do you mean where I'm from <laughs> like um <laughs> but but uh, but uh, I, I think uh, uh, it's also interesting when the, uh, in the in the first uh, in the first uh, uh, was like in, in our previous uh, chat before uh, you are talking that uh, y- yourself is a Pacific uh, your identity is a Pacific it's I think it's also interesting that uh, maybe uh, the Pacific or Ocean and itself is a is has a has a meaning that. Uh, our identity is is mixed. Yeah. We are not from uh, uh, the the, the uh, definitive roots, but it, uh, we are mixed. Yeah. Um, I was thinking a lot about um, what does it like because I was living in London for a year. I was thinking about what does it mean to be an island on the islander on the wrong island. Um, uh, <laughs> um, but also like. Um, I'm from Fiji and so I'm part of an archipelago, you know, and so like in many ways, like I really love this idea of an archipelago and and this idea of that the ocean is a place of connection rather than a space of division. Um, and um, there's that sort of wonderful, um, I'm going to, Apeli Hawafa's quote where he talks about um you know that um i'm not an island in a far off sea i'm actually you know i'm i'm construct like the, the space of the ocean is the space of construction and i think that that's really like that to me has given me a lot of hope in these last few years especially because 
um, as an as a young like as a person coming into the scene and trying to figure out who I am uh like a really big thing for me was to try and meet other Fijian artists like I think I went through this phase of like oh you're Fijian can we hang out like um (laughs) but but it was also it was about trying to like see like to see myself in others and to be like oh I'm capable of that as well um and to kind of see a sight line and to be like oh actually I'm not an island I'm part of an archipelago like there's a network and a community um and a wealth like and an ocean of wealth here and and um which is cheesy but I think works (laughs) okay uh now, Edith, uh, uh, how, how you define uh, as a as a someone uh, descendant who live and uh, born in the Aotearoa, uh, and also lot like a like a, almost lots of uh, people uh, like a someone or Tongan descendant who live in Aotearoa, uh, how do you define your your roots? Uh, like uh, Sipanjani talks, uh, who am I? Like uh, who are you, <laughs> Edith? <sighs> Yeah, I might answer that question uh, together with um, the question from Putri. Uh, it's a similar question, so I might go um, answer the same sort of question about our roots and and what it's like to to visit, you know, the homeland. Um, and uh, I. I feel very privileged that I can go back and forth to Samoa, to the homeland. But it is—I realize it is not um, its not an opportunity that many families or all families can um, have, or a relationship with their homeland. If they're if you're a refugee and there's strife in your country, your homeland. Um, the track back there may be difficult, but uh, I'm lucky I had like a close relationship to my ancestral homeland, but I feel very connected to my ans- uh, adopted homeland, which is New Zealand. I'm very um, interested in the place that my parents were migrated to, the land of milk and honey, you know, that migrant dream of uh, a better place it might be New Zealand it might be Australia uh, it might be England often it has um, colonial power background so uh, often there's labour um, promise there's sort of uh, labour shortage dreams connected to that migration so often the your homeland can't provide this, come to this new place, we can provide a better land. So I'm quite interested in the person I've become in the place, the new promised land. Sorry to use Christian um, analogies, it's background. (laughs) But uh, uh, it is very difficult to kind of unravel who you are. and sometimes you see your mother or your father and you're like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, there's some things, some traits that you see um, that look like you. And when you go back to Samoa or wherever, you may see a characteristic that you recognize. It's like, oh, that's where it comes from. Maybe it's the way you suck your teeth. You know that? <laughs> You know that expression? Uh, I don't know. Um, that's a way we call people. That's, yeah, so like, that's not something I learned from New Zealand. Uh, but I, I like it. I like the, when it's murky, you know, when it's not clear. It's like, oh, is it from there or is it from there? So I, I spend my whole kind of artist career trying to, um track that overlap where uh these things sit together um and often it's not always pretty you know when cultures overlap uh at the moment um 
I, I don't know how to explain the phenomenon, but uh, lots of young Pacific Islanders are playing really loud music from their car. They drive around Auckland and they are playing um, often Celine Dion, <laughs> a lot of pop music um, blaring from loud speakers, from fire alarms. It's not a lot in New Zealand people are not happy <laughs> with that expression. Um, so I, um, how we define who we are, I think it's a, a constant negotiation. I think we're always uh, taking on and um, negating these ideas. So uh, I, I just find that wildly interesting and um, we are far more connected than we are uh, different. So I also find that sort of um, wildly interesting. And uh, before I stop, I also, I mean, it must be similar experience, I think, that many people can connect to. But uh, when you don't have the language, people know straight away you're an outsider. Mm. So I know when I go to Samoa, people make fun of my, you know, Samoa, and, and they know straight away I'm not <laughs> from there. <laughs> so uh, it is quite pronounced, you know, yeah, your yeah, visit, yeah. you don't sneak in easily, right? People know uh, by the way you look, the clothes you wear, the way you walk, it's, um, you'll be the same but different. Mm. And uh, I have no problem with that. Like, uh, it may it may take a long time to kind of come to that understanding, but uh, um, sometimes uh, maybe we need those those lines to say, oh, you are like us, but you are different. Um, tell us about those differences. Tell us about um, what it's like to grow up in New Zealand um, and to be rich. <laughs> because we're always rich when we come from another place. So uh, I really like that, um, the kind of way that you've been made to feel like an outsider. Uh, I don't try to hide that. Like uh, my family very much uh, don't try to hide that with me. So, yeah, that's. I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, Talking about the outsider things, uh, do you see Panjani uh, ever uh, going back or visit the uh, Fiji? I mean, I there was a really long period of time where I didn't, um, mm. and but recently, um, I have been going back or trying to go back more regularly. And um, my father, my father's family, still have access to their mm. farm in Fiji, mm. um, and so but none of my family live in that house anymore. And so this place has become this thing that I know is slipping away. And so there's this sort of, for me, there's this real um, like responsibility to kind of record it or try and hold on to it because uh, it has meant so much to me personally, but I know it's meant so much to my my family and like, but I don't know if, I mean, I don't have kids, but in, in the future I might. And I, I don't know if they will have the same frequency of access. And so it feels important to try and hold on to, to it. It feels like I'm like holding on to sand. And, and so it's like, it, it's like a, because um, at, 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 any, at any point it can disappear. And, and so it's this sort of, um it's a, like it's it's a, it's hard and I think that that that's also like a I don't know like a feeling of um because I I like I, they know immediately that I'm not from there and I don't have great Hindi skills I try but also I've spent some time in India and so I think that that has also influenced my capacity to speak and um but it is also like interesting to understand that there is a place that you know will no longer be part of you um that for as long as I can, I'll try and hold on to. Um, but I think like something that I've been thinking a lot about every time I go back is to try and like remind myself that I'm actually 
coming in as an outsider and so like what does it like for long periods of time in my practice I was using a photo like a photo album that my nanny had my grandma my maternal grandmother and so recently every time I've gone back I've tried to take Polaroids to create my own archive to kind of create my own understanding of this place as it is right now um because that feels as important as kind of looking backwards and like not trying to make it nostalgic but trying to be as present as possible because I think um, maybe the problem with diasporic feeling is is that we're trapped into this type of nostalgia that actually can't acknowledge the shifts that have happened you know and and like uh, and you know there's many things that have happened that have actually been really incredible you know um and uh and, and so, like, I, I, I'm, tr- like, one of the things, and, like, you know, I'm really mindful that, um, like, I've lived and worked in the, the West predominantly for most of my practice, most of my artistic career. And so, like, should I be talking or should I be asking you to speak to somebody from Fiji, you know? Yeah, uh, I once read, uh, I forgot where, but... Uh... Uh, I read that uh, the 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 Indian descendant in Fiji until now is still perceived as a pulagi or uh, or guest. Uh, uh, they 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 well they 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 uh, they lived uh, there for over three generations, yeah. but uh, until now they still perceived as a guest or pulagi. Yeah. Do you what do you think about it? Um, I mean, it, I've always had such a complex feeling about that like I've I've understood that I was like I've I mean I think it's been really interesting politically because um uh up until the recent government uh like there has been this sort of shift in language and saying that we are Fijian um but also recently there have been um uh, uh ceremonies with indigenous communities that have um acknowledge this community and that I think has been really like I think it's sort of moving away from a colonial mindset which was about dividing and kind of setting up structures that would create dissent or dis- like um, tension um, so it's really interesting to be on the outside looking in on those relationships um, and uh, because I think they're really important and critical conversations that are happening in Fiji that are changing the language of what it means to be um, a Pacific person. But in the context of diaspora, like, um, like uh, it's incredible to me that uh, I'm in the conversation about Oceania, you know, like, uh, you know, it's a huge, like, honour, you know, uh, because I think uh, this is a this is a history that's been ha- like my community's history is 142 years and it is a Pacific history and it has legacy in relationships in terms of blackbirding in Australia and New Zealand uh, that, that like it has huge ramifications and yet we don't speak to it and 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 I think that's partly because uh with this shame attached to that but also because I think the people who needed to speak to it also needed to grow in language um and grow in like educating ourselves and and navigating that I'm not saying that I'm the perfect example of that but you know that that um but it, it's you, you know like I think that the generation who was supposed to be telling these stories are telling them, you know, um, and I think people are responding to that, which is really exciting. That's a very interesting, uh, Sipanjani. And uh, I want to reflect uh, uh, our, our was like a discussion uh, to, to the phenomenon that uh, I heard uh, from Simo Cardoso from Mong. Uh, that uh, today, uh, young young people in uh, Timor Leste uh, had a, like a two visas that ha- has a two passport, like a Timor Leste passport and also the European passport. And yes. 
yes it, uh, it's it makes uh, them uh, easily was like uh, moving uh, from uh, from uh, their uh, home country to yes. other country in the Europe and uh, uh, Mong told me that uh, that makes a uh, lot of uh, people in the young young people in in Timor Leste wants to uh, moving out uh, from from Timor Leste. What do you think about uh, this, Maria? Um, well, I think that Simang is is right, and the we've got dual citizenship in Timor. Yeah, yeah. You're allowed to have uh, the Portuguese passport and the Timorese passport, and because East Timor adopted Portuguese as another official language, um, it suited the young people that they are they feel Portuguese as well, so they can go to Europe. You know, because with a Portuguese passport in the European Union, you can travel around uh, as part of being European. But um, I mean, that's an issue that um, I've, I find very complex. Um, as, as an East Timorese, my, my, fa- my grandfather is Portuguese, my grandmother is Chinese, my, this is paternal. And then my maternal grandparents, she's from India, He's from Timor, so I feel like it's a global, uh, I've got global, uh, international, um, multicultural, diverse blood. Nice. But, <laughs> but um, the thing is, is that um, I really want to talk about the language that they're talking about because I feel like that. I'm, I, is, as an East Timorese, when I went to Portugal, I was a minority. When I, Portuguese were my, my main language, but as soon as I spoke Portuguese, they thought, no, you're not Portuguese. So I come to Australia, I look indigenous, Aboriginal Australian, but as soon as I open my mouth, you've got an accent, where are you from? And then I get a chance to go to Timor. So I speak Tatum. Oh, you've got an accent, where are you from? So all this maternal and paternal blood that I've got um, does not, um, although I know I have it, but as soon as I open my mouth, everyone questions. Because I don't, I feel like I'm in, in the diaspora, no matter where I am. In Australia, I feel like I'm from overseas. In Portugal, I feel like I'm from overseas. In Timor, I feel like I'm from overseas. And I think a lot of Timorese feel that way, because the sense of belonging, the sense of identity in East Timor. Um, I mean, until the independence, only maybe thirty percent of the the population was was literate because it is a living culture. You don't need to go to school, you leave it. And um, so the East Timorese, when they, when they felt like after the independence that we got the two passports, wow, freedom is here because during the occupation, you're not even allowed to leave the city. So this chance of having two passports is flying. We are, we're gonna fly. And, and when I went to Timor, there, there was a lot of Timorese, you know, saying to me, oh, you were lucky, you know, during the, the occupation, you left, um, you ran away, we had to stay here and fight. And I thought, oh, try a refugee camp. It's not very nice. <laughs> That's the first thing. And the second thing is, yes, we did run away during the occupation. Now East Timor is free. Everyone wants to go away. If during the, if now that it's free and independent, everyone wants to leave, imagine when it was under the occupation and, and you know, during the civil war, who didn't want to run away? And I think that the, the young people have they've got, their hope is that East Timor, because it's such a young nation, and honestly, there is not much opportunity in Timor because most of us are still learning what's like to walk, you know, Recording in progress. A lot of the, the uh, local language, we've got over 30 local languages. Yeah. And the, the, the common language is Tatum between yeah. all of us. 
But every time I spoke Tetan to a lot of the older people, there is this nostalgic thing, oh, they want to speak Portuguese because they haven't spoken Portuguese for 40 years. Um, and I think that sense of, of seeing that their grandparents' sense of belonging also gives the, the young people, I think they've heard, would have heard a lot of stories about Portuguese times, not necessarily the best, you know, because colonization is colonization, yeah. <laughs> whether, you know, no matter how you look at it. But because of that, not, the his, Timorese are very, very deeply rooted in their history. Yeah. So the history of 500 years and the chance of really going and see Portugal. Yeah. Um, yeah, Simon was right. You can, yeah. you can fly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, and I understand that's, it completely. <laughs> and and it's, it's really interesting. Uh, uh, I, I, I stuck on the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, your your words when the we are uh, uh, was like uh, accept that we are a mixture uh, from yes. uh, a very very diverse uh, uh, was like a, a descendant yes. uh, and uh, we we uh, perceive that uh, ourselves was a uh, is a, a global citizen yes. and and yes. that's that's leads leads me to uh, other question or or next question so. So do, do you think in, in the diaspora reality, uh, we uh, how how do we perceive the the, the notes of uh, nationalism, the the notion of uh, what what is what what is nationalism to to you? Because because uh, I myself is uh, I, I'm uh, I don't uh, I I never be a diaspora, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have to learn from from you guys. Uh, how did you perceive the nationalism? Uh, maybe Maria, do you have? Okay, um, for me, nationalism is not static. Mm. Um, it's you always look at there is a seed, and that's 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 the seed, and that's the root of who you are, but giving globalization, giving the world that we're in now, especially with, with media, with, with you know, the development and the progress of the, of the international communities. Um, nationalism has got two senses, a sense of, well, of being yourself in here, in your heart and with your community, and also the opportunity to be open to all different diverse culture. Um, and, and, and it's that door, that, that doorway that gives me a sense of belonging because I'm so happy to be Timorese and I'm so happy to be granddaughter of a Portuguese and a granddaughter of a Chinese that I think if I don't open myself to that, I would lose my sense of being. So nationalism for me is you've got the essential of who you are and then you've got the doorway that gives you the chance and the opportunity to fly with the international community. You become a, it's a bridge. So I've got my, my, my steady foot, and then I've got that bridgeway that allows me to be. Nice. That's my, for me, nationalism. Nice. Uh, how, how about you, Edith? Uh, maybe you have uh, another person uh, of like a... Uh, yeah, it's a interesting word, you know, particularly living in a co former colony. Yeah. Um, often it excludes uh, even indigenous ideas of what nationhood means. So uh, it's it's a, it can be a scary word, you know, sort of mm, nation building and nationalistic interests. And often it doesn't include migrants that I feel. Um, and I often ideas of nationalism only include the parts mm, those in power like that is beneficial to those in power. Uh, mm -hmm. We like your rugby playing skills, <laughs> but we don't like uh, that you play loud music all night mm -hmm. from your car, right? So these ideas of... Um, what makes a nation is not uh, is skewed. So I um, and I realize that patriotism is not the same as uh, ideas of nationalism. So um, it's not a word I um, immediately feel connected to or understand. But um, that's not 
to say one feels connected to a place, you know, or, or even proud. Um, so uh, I think what makes up a place and your connection to a place is murky <laughs> and it's complicated as we've all heard about histories um, that brings peoples to places and then those people have to figure out how to be and also uh, remember even those histories when people aren't even remembering those histories. So um, I take a place of uh, positivity or um, I take a place of like a, um, I don't take a disempowered point of view. I say like, oh, our people are amazing <laughs> and our contribution to these places yeah. is uh, amazing. And if you did not have connection yeah. to our people, perhaps we would not be the best rugby playing nation in the world. So uh, if we think about export of, of not only um, product, Oh, sorry, product, but human product. Um, the Pacific uh, has produced many and exported many um, sporting talents across Australia and uh, New Zealand. So um, I think it's, we can't think about a nation without the contribution of that labor and, and export labor. And, uh, and like we talked about earlier about jobs, that came from a particular place, slave labor that then turned into um, labor shortage or migrant labor, but it is um, all these things contribute to building of nations. So um, it's not, I'm not ashamed nor um, I'm just really proud of what we contribute to places despite how we come to those places so um it would be a very boring place without <laughs> the, <laughs> without migrants yeah that's true that's true yeah, that's what true. do you think about the food yeah, yeah in yeah, many yeah. places it yeah, would yeah. be boring yeah, well, so yeah, yeah. um <laughs> so i try and take a positive outlook yeah. otherwise it becomes a downward spiral <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and also in this uh, Biennale, uh, we also uh, was like uh, exhibited uh, uh, works uh, from a collective called uh, "Upon Its uh, Rivers of the of an Island," which uh, talking uh, about the, the the refugee from uh, Afghan refugee that was uh, trapped in Indonesia for so long. Like uh, they can trap uh, here uh, for uh, more than uh, ten years, or so. So. Uh, uh, their 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 uh, destination uh, country was uh, Australia or New Zealand, but because the the nationalism or, or the border or, or or the geographical border, they cannot uh, easily going in to the destination uh, country. So they trapped here in in Indonesia for so long, and and that's also uh, uh, was like a makes us a uh, rethink about the. What is the the connection relations uh, about the what's like the, the refugee and the, how uh, the, the with the with the destination country? So yeah, that's uh, I think that's a very layered and uh, it's problematic. Yeah, and, yeah, so, yeah, it's all that layered yeah. and problematic yeah, and yeah, amazing yeah, yeah. and destitute and yeah, just yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, it's complicated. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, and Sifan Jenny, maybe you have uh, another uh, perspective on the nationalism. What I mean, nationalism I, means to you? I, I think, I mean, there's a part of me that wants to say that uh, because I live in Australia, that in many ways um, that nationalism is just a, a type of defaulting to a, a type of supremacy of a kind. Um, uh, but it's also it's it's more complicated than that, and um, and uh, and and I'm also really aware that um, in a different place, like 
having come to this place at a particular time and place, I was able to access things that I know that I wouldn't have had access to. Like I wouldn't be an artist if I was still in Fiji. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible. And I think about that woman a lot, the woman that I could have been a lot because she still exists, you know, and she's, you know, she exists within the context of my family. And and so I'm really mindful of all of the things that I've been able to gain by being in this place at this time. Um, and But it's also that thing of like, that doesn't mean that I'm not allowed to critique it um, because actually I think there's something really important about ensuring that 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 the things that make us up or construct us or the things that we love also understand that, hey, something was wrong here uh, and actually how do we uh, kind of shape shift or be accountable to that history because they've... And also because there is possibility for change. Well, I, I, I at least hope that there is. Um, and, yeah, I don't know if that answered that question, but I think, I mean, it's it's kind of, it's impo- like um, it's impossible to kind of not think about the, the institution of colonialism and the Commonwealth and all of these structures that have been placed um outside of the communities that actually existed here and and like how do we how do we navigate those relationships um yeah I don't know yeah it's a I think it's a very difficult and a tricky question Thanks. because uh, if you ask me uh, about the nationalism itself um, I don't think I have a answer about it <laughs> <laughs> like what is nationalism uh, in relation to uh, like uh, because because uh, for for young people uh, like me when the, I talk uh, about the, the Indonesia, uh, the, the nationalism is itself is I think it's overrated. It's overrated and uh, and it's it became uh, became uh, was like a jargon. It's just a jargon uh, mm. when we when we uh, talking about the how do we uh, was like position the Papua in our nationalism. That's that's a uh, that's I think it's quite uh, quite uh, difficult to 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 answer I think so yeah I will uh, I will say I yeah. do love my passport like I'm I'm very <laughs> grateful for my Australian passport like <laughs> um, does that make me nationalistic I'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a very rich uh, <laughs> conversation, I think, this afternoon uh, because uh, you know uh, we talk uh, on the the notion of diaspora to migrant aesthetic to to the what's like a uh, uh, the displacement to the colonialism to the nationalism. So <laughs> thank you very much uh, as a. As a part of a curatorial team in in uh, Biennale Jogja, I will say to thank you very much uh, to your uh, participation in this Biennale, and uh, I will say that uh, your works uh, is uh, perfectly captured the the idea, the notion of uh, diaspora realities in this world, and uh, I I also thank that uh, we can uh, do a conversation, a rich conversation this afternoon. So see you next time, uh, Edith, uh, Sifanjani, and Maria. Uh, hope you are still healthy and uh, fun. <laughs> so yeah, uh, thank you very much, and uh, see you next time. Thank Ciao. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Bye. Very proud. Well, bye. Bye. Well done. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Roots. Roots. Mm. Binale Jukja 16, 2000.